Good morning. Well, my sisters and brothers, we are, we are here again in another intense racial reckoning moment. It is in these moments that expose the lies we tell about ourselves, about the kind of nation that we are. I like to share a sort of interesting juxtaposition of the various stories we tell about African Americans. It's just a sampling of stories we love to tell about black people, about America. The slavery was abolished. We love to tell the stories about the origins of the, the black church. I learned about Phyllis Wheatley and Harriet Tubman in elementary school uh, in America. And who doesn't know about Rosa Parks and her refusal uh, to move to the colored section of the bus, a seminal event that led to the Montgomery bus boycott. We love the stories about Dr. King and the March on Washington, or the sort of rags to riches stories of people like Oprah Winfrey, uh, and of course, Michelle and Barack Obama. But there are stories we do not tell. Stories of grinding poverty, stories of a grotesque system of segregation that went on for over a century. There are stories about lynching Thousands upon thousands of African Americans were lynched in this country, and this went on for decades. These lynchings were attended by hundreds of thousands of white Americans observing the spectacle of violence. Or what black person does not feel terror at the sight of those blue lights in their rearview mirror? Stories of an African-American woman being arrested one day and dead the next. Or how the spectacle of death hangs over us. In every era, on every turn, there is pain, trauma, and nihilism. That's the part of the black story we often don't like to give voice to. So the black faith tradition tries to do an array of things, whether it is inspiring compassion, goodness, understanding, whether it is helping us to grapple with deep questions of meaning as we try to make sense of centuries of grinding racism. Faith is also a wonderful resource that even serves as a corrective when religion goes wrong. And so one of the great legacies of the black faith tradition is that uh, it actually teaches us how to correct the very thing that we love. And so I sort of describe black faith as, uh, as a dance with hope and despair. I'm from a part of the black faith tradition where uh, when we get the spirit, we, we shout, we dance, we move. And so embodied spirituality is just a deep part of the, of the Pentecostal tradition that I grew up in. It is the tradition that retained those Africanisms. But faith is very much a dance with hope and despair. There are songs in our tradition that says, we shall overcome, I know it. Deep in my heart, we shall overcome. There's also a song that says, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And so we are going to have this important conversation this morning and joining us for this conversation. And I am so honored to have Dr. Johnny Bernard Hill, who is the founder and president of the World House Forum in Raleigh, North Carolina and the senior pastor of Gethsemane Missionary Baptist Church. He has previously served as the dean at the Divinity School at Shaw University, 
where he founded the Center for Racial and Social Justice. He's also my old boss, the department chair at Claflin University, uh, one of the, our outstanding HBCUs. With the support of the Lilly Endowment, he established the Black Church Leadership Academy and the Awakening Campaign Initiative for Transformative Engagement. He is the author of a stellar book entitled Prophetic Rage, A Post-Colonial Theology of Liberation, and the first black president, Barack Obama, Race, Politics, and the American Dream. He has studied at Duke University and Garrett University where he earned his PhD in philosophical theology. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome with me Dr. Johnny Hill. And after Dr. Johnny Hill presents, Sheila Wise Rose will join us uh, virtually. She holds a master's degree in counseling and hails from Boston. She has lived in Paris and Johannesburg, South Africa. For over 25 years, she has been a counselor, spiritual director, author, and speaker. She is a truth teller who writes passionately about matters of faith and emotional healing. She advocates for the dignity, rights, and healing of abuse survivors, those carrying racial trauma, and racial reconciliation. Sheila has taught trauma healing and psychology at several colleges and the Africa Peace Institute in South Africa. She is the author of the award-winning book, Healing Racial Trauma, the Road to Resilience, and her newest book, Young, Gifted, and Black, A Journey of Lament and Celebration, will be released next year, February 2022. Will you welcome with me this morning, Sheila Wise Rose. So here's how the rest of this first hour is going to go. They're gonna be brief 10 to 12 minute presentations, beginning with Dr. Hill, followed by Sheila Wise Rose, and then I will circle back around uh, and present on nihilism as well. There'll be a musical interlude. Uh, and then we're going to have a conversation that you will have an opportunity uh, to engage in as well. So put on your seat belts and take a deep breath and go with us on this journey. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like you to put your hands together and give yourselves a big round of applause for your presence here today. I'm so super excited to share with you uh, for just a few moments uh, on the theme of the courage to dream. The courage to dream. Um, I think it's so important um, in this day and age that we find the space to dream that we find the courage to have a prophetic imagination, to think beyond what is, and to begin to imagine what can be. Because if we stay where we are, we know where that leads, right? We know that the 2020 pandemic and the death of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, Armand Aubrey, in fact, they're doing the deliberations today, uh, concluding the, uh, the trial of, involving the death of of Armand Aubrey down in Brunswick, Georgia, where thousands of pastors gathered yesterday on the steps of the courthouse to protest. We know that if we stay where we are, then the road leads to nihilism. More streets will burn. More communities will be devastated. More hearts will be broken. And we'll continue to live amid the challenge of racial hostility the struggle to build a meaningful, loving community for us all. So I believe that this is a time to dream. I mean, I think that this is a moment to imagine the possibilities like never before, to move forward, to think imaginatively, to look at your own dreams, because we all have dreams. I mean, we can be honest, right? We all have our own individual dreams for our families, for our communities, for our churches, for our nation, for our world. But how can we learn how to dream together? I wanna to begin by just talking a little bit about my own story. 
The fact that I'm standing on this stage this morning is a miracle. It's a miracle because I can't divorce my presence on this stage, Dr. Brogdon, from being a black boy growing up in southeast Georgia on the edge of an old plantation in the belly of the south where my father was a sanitation worker, not unlike those that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. marched with down in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. My mother cleared bedpans for the sick and dying in the city's nursing homes. For much of her life, she served. She made the world better. My father did as well as a sanitation worker. I remember going with him on many days as he took pride in his job as a sanitation worker to help the city run better, to help uh, communities move forward in a humble, gentle, and honorable manner. We learned about that during the pandemic, didn't we? About the power of frontline essential workers and how the concept of essential workers became front and center because we're told that somehow those who are powerful are most important. But what we learn about the existential condition of our lives is that the first perhaps shall be last and the last will be first. Can we give ourselves a round of applause for recognizing that we're learning something in this time. I've had the privilege of of marching and protesting and working alongside of Black Lives Matter workers, but then going to church on Sunday morning and preaching to congregations in both urban and rural spaces and noticing the challenge that we certainly have in the present moment. See, my story is a story of black pain. Sure, I could talk about the complex nuances of nihilism and, and ecclesiology and soteriology and all of those con uh, concepts. But I wanna share with you a little bit about my story. You see, I, I, as I shared, I was raised on the edge of an old plantation in the belly of the South. I grew up with seven amazing sisters and a large extended family. We were poor, but we were loved. We had a community that nurtured and formed us. And in that small little town in southeast Georgia, there were two churches. There was the little church that I grew up in, Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, where we'd sing songs like, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word, can't turn around now, we've come this far by faith. I left that town, joined the army, where I spent four and a half years, a year in South Korea serving this nation, and then attended Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was introduced to Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and work. So it led me to this stage today, friends, to talk about the courage to dream. And I'm inviting you this morning to dream with me. I'm inviting us to have the courage to dream, to dream the impossible dream, dream the dream that led Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to give his life for the cause of freedom, justice, and human dignity. And to begin to imagine black bodies as sacred space. To begin to imagine for just a moment the idea of black bodies as sacred space. Maybe it sounds novel to some, but we live in a cultural reality, a world that has been immersed in white supremacy, white nationalism, and nihilism, that often polices out the concept of black bodies as sacred space. Sacred space as a space that inhabits the Holy Spirit and that God's presence and the activity of God unfolds in those spaces. The story of Jacob Blake is an example of the struggle. Breonna Taylor and many others 
that marginalizes and suppresses and dehumanizes black life, that sometimes renders black life as meaningless, as devoid of purpose and significance and stories. So we have an opportunity, friends, to think about black pain, not as a foil, black pain not as a foil for working through our own moral imagination, not as a, a, a sort of means to simply reckon with our own struggles with racism or with sexism or with violence, but to reckon with black pain uh, as an occasion to think critically about God's presence, God's healing, and God's transformative wisdom in our lives. I'm gonna talk a little bit about an awakening of the dignity of black life today with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, that black life is a gift to humanity, and that finally we have to find the courage to dream. First of all, and I don't have very much time, first of all, uh, black bodies as sacred space is a challenge to evangelical Christianity. We all know the history of slavery, of colonialism, uh, Jim Crow segregation, reconstruction. But one of the challenges we face with the evangelical church is to really reckon not only with the reality of race, but finding, finding the courage, the moral imagination to take action and to take steps to go beyond the horrors of the past, to imagine a possibility of a great, uh, powerful future. Well, one of the reasons why we have to deal with the reality of black bodies as sacred space is because it disrupts the narrative of white supremacy. It's very hard, I think, for some of us to talk about white supremacy, but it is a reality that we're shaped and formed in. I remember growing up as a small kid down in, in rural Georgia and, and seeing the disparities up close and personal. I could see on a daily basis the black community, folks who work the, 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 the most uh, difficult, challenging, dirty work of society, where our white counterparts had the more powerful positions. So from the time we're children, we are internalizing these coded messages about race, racial categories, bodies, and how we interpret black bodies as well. It becomes a contestation with empire and with nihilism. And this is the part that I get excited about is because black life refuses to give up. There is a continuation of hope in the midst of hopelessness, of joy in the midst of pain, of laughter in the midst of struggle, that there is a persistence for life, for justice, for freedom, and human dignity for all. Black pain and the struggle for human dignity reveals that we can learn so much from the black struggle about how to deal with our larger cultural problems related to nihilism. Because guess what, friends? It's not just black folks that are struggling with nihilism. We have a cultural problem with nihilism. The Pew studies that came out in 2014 and 2019 revealed the problem of young adults between 19 and, and 30 who are dramatically and profoundly leaving mainline congregations. That in a real sense, white congregations and black churches will be empty in 10 to 20 years. And so if we don't address this deeper perennial problem of nihilism, of meaninglessness, of hopelessness and despair, then we will all suffer a very, very tragic end. But black life can teach us so much about how to not give up, about how to stay, stay true to your purpose, about how to be persistent in your vision, in your hope. One of my favorite lines from Dr. King is when he would say, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight, he said this in Memphis, Tennessee, the night before he died, 
I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. We all have a dream, friends. Let us dream together. I remember standing on the steps of the state capitol in Raleigh, North Carolina. This was during the pandemic, just weeks after uh, George, uh, George Floyd uh, had died and been killed in that gutter. And I recall seeing thousands, probably close to 10,000 um, people from all walks of life coming together, black and white, rich and poor, Jew and Muslim, young and old, grounded in this idea and this principle of human dignity that all life matters and that there is a sacredness in the life of black men and black women. And that if we can learn to appreciate the lives of the least of us, then we can honor the lives of us all. As I conclude, friends, I believe there's an awakening in our midst. The Black Lives Matter movement has shown that there is a passion, there is a drive, there is a determination, there is a persistence that will not be deterred. And even though it may have appeared for just a moment, a glimpse, and then somehow settle down, the fact that we've seen it at work is a revelation of what's possible. That across this nation, from, from east coast to west coast, in nearly every town in the nation, there were protests outcries of indignation in the presence of the inhumanity to a human being. We're now so connected with social media that it has given us the capacity to connect and, co to, and to, to, to have access to information that we've never had before. Perhaps it becomes a gateway to dismantling multiple systems of oppression. As I conclude, friends, I just want to ask a question. Do you have the courage to dream? Do we have the courage to dream today to not get satisfied with what is, but to really begin to work to see what's possible, not just for this generation, but for the generations to come? Let's dream together, friends. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. That was... Um, a compelling presentation. Uh, I want to do just a brief uh, follow-up question, if you could give us just a, maybe a 30-second response. Because to me, one of, the, one of the gifts of the black faith tradition is that, for example, it gives us language to give voice to things. So whether it's drawing on, on scripture uh, or whether we are creating spaces that are safe for us to, to be who we are. What does, how has the black church been either giving language or providing space, you know, to, to address those issues of pain? How have you, you know, how have you seen that either in your work or in your research? Absolutely. Well, I, I think that's a really compelling question. And Kelly Brown Douglas made some really powerful points last night when she talked about churches as a sacred space spaces of safety, security, and not just spaces of safety and security, but spaces of transformation, spaces of inspiration and hope and renewal for the struggles that they encounter right. in their lives. That's been the case historically where black churches were not only spiritual institutions, but also social, political, economic resources as well. And I think to address these problems of nihilism, to address these issues related to you know, racial hostility, racial injustice, uh, means going beyond just simply the spiritual needs of folks, but really recognizing that we are multidimensional, complex beings that have a, a myriad of different needs. And the black church has been, and in many spaces continues to be, uh, resources for all of those different needs uh, that folks encounter. Yeah, I'm going to want to press a little bit more in the second hour on, on some of those issues because uh, to me one of the disconnects with the contemporary black church tradition 
is where in the Negro spirituals you could give voice to that kind of existential pain. Whereas in a lot of contemporary black churches, it's almost as if they don't want you to talk about your pain. You know, we have to come in and pretend that everything is okay. Right. Um, and that's really not helping people to deal with some of those painful realities. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to furthering that conversation. Uh, but we want to con uh, press ahead and we are going to hear uh, the, the lecture for, from Sheila Wise Rose and then I have a follow up question for her as well. Hello, hi, I am so excited to be here. My name is Sheila Wise Rowe. I am an author, I am a counselor, I'm a speaker. Uh, I specifically uh, work with men, women, children around trauma, uh, have been involved in ministry in the US as well as South Africa and in Paris, France. And so today I'm coming to share um, some of what is uh, in my book, Healing Racial Trauma, The Road to Resilience, uh, and um, drawing from some of my experience in counseling. And with that, I want to dive in. I, I'm grateful for the other panelists and what they bring to the conversation. It's really essential. Um, as we think about racial trauma, it's important that we're thinking about what has gone before us and what is happening right now, that the two have a way of interplaying. One thing that struck me recently was in this year, it was the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. And I remember watching the, the uh, Congress uh, testimony of 107 year old uh, Viola Fletcher and how moving that was. And I remember her saying just in, in vivid detail, what she experienced, what she endured. And she said that, you know, that she lived through that massacre, not just that day, but every day since. And that our country may forget, but that she doesn't forget. And that really struck me that that is the reality for so many of people of color, black folk, like we experience it daily and we may not even be aware of that. One of the things that um, I really think about uh, around trauma and racial trauma specifically is that how much it is very much linked to grief. And, and so I want to unpack that more and kind of look at racial trauma from a, a grief lens um, because I believe in this particular season with COVID and with everything that's happened last year and this year and even before, that we're carrying a boatload of grief and a boatload of trauma. I don't think it bears repeating, but I'm gonna repeat it, that racism really is about power and dominance and control and asserting that, that dominance. Uh, racism inflicts racial trauma and at the same time it denies the pain um, that is caused. One of the scriptures that really highlights this for me is Jeremiah 6.14, where it says, they've treated the wounds of my people carelessly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And this happens, and it has happened, and it continues to happen when we are not believed, that when a black person comes and shares their stories, shares their trauma, they're, they're not believed. We're not believed. There's a denial about systemic racism um, that it exists. Um, there's an attempt to gaslight us, to say, well, that's not really what that is. It's not, um, it, it shouldn't be a concern and you need to get over it. A lot of the conversation right now about critical race theory is also that it's a way of shutting down um, black people and brown people. And, and yet the reality is that we feel that trauma every single day. Ironically, that sometimes we're seeing, although, you know, not, uh, from this kind of negative lens, but in a way that it is, and that we're seen as otherworldly. Like, you know, we're able to really withstand emotional and physical pain and trauma. Um, and, and that somehow, you know, we have this super strength, but at the same time, we are also accused of being lazy. Um, racial trauma is real. Every one of us, deals with it on some level, whether we're aware of it or not. And even the ones that we see that are kind of propped up as the ones who are saying systemic racism doesn't exist, there's a level of racial trauma behind that. Some of us, as in that case, say peace, peace when there is no peace. 
uh, some of us have had dysfunctional ways in which we've responded to trauma to try to cope. Um, and for many of us, that was silence because in our families, um, in our, uh, as we look at the enslavement of our ancestors, silence had to, to be uh, paramount because we could lose a loved one um, if we opened up our mouths. Um, and so we've shut down and, and we're fearful about looking inward. Um, and there's a lot of stigma around that. Some of us, um, you know, d despite all of what has transpired, we have a faith and a hope that is really grounded in our experience in we looking at scripture, although we were handed a Bible that was chopped up in pieces. And, uh, and, and yet we saw in the story of the Israelites escaping from Egypt to freedom, our story. And it inspired us and gave us hope. And we saw in the story of Jesus as the one who was sinless and um, the one who could empathize with our weaknesses. Um, and, and in that, we found hope. We found hope for freedom. We found hope to pursue justice. And, and, and we, we continue to hold on to that to this day. And yet, racial trauma rears its head almost regularly. And so what is racial, racial trauma? Racial trauma is different from other forms of trauma. There's a, a notion in, in counseling about big T traumas and little t traumas. Big T traumas being ones where there's been like some major event, there's violence involved. Little t traumas are more troubling instances. And, um, and so we, we have these different kinds of engagements with trauma. For black folk, we're experiencing big T traumas and little t traumas together. There have been studies that have shown that when you actually look at little t traumas and if you have multiple little t traumas, you actually experience a greater impact and greater trauma than a big, huge one-time event. And so if you think about that and you think about the folk who've been pulled over by police officers and they have said, and, and you can look at that and go, well, what's the big deal? You were pulled over by a police officer. In many of those instances, these people, men and women, were pulled over not one, two, three, but hundreds of times. And so that does something to one. It does something to our ability to hope and to persevere. When we experience a racial trauma, what happens is that our bodies are ready for fight or flight. We're charged. Our hormones, our nervous system, body, everything is on high alert, and we feel like we've got to take immediate action against an actual threat. But if we don't deal with that stress, it stays in our bodies and it starts to affect us. And then another incident happened, and then we're in this perpetual loop where the stress just builds and builds. I, I want to say that, you know, racial trauma is not just about something that's happening right now. It's not just about a, a recent incident, but it can go back in time. There's a study of, called epigenetics, which looks at how our ancestors, um, what they endured, how that in some ways has weakened the DNA without changing the structure of it, but that then we're more susceptible to things like heart disease and um, we're, we are dealing with issues around emotional dysfunction, et cetera. Um, we have symptoms that rear up. Our minds may forget, but our bodies don't. Um, some of racial trauma is transmitted through family lines, through stories. Um, we hear about our ancestors and what they endured, um, and, and that affects us as well. We get we, and experience racial trauma vicariously also from watching videos, viral videos. We experience it real time. And the effect is that we start to show signs of racial trauma, and that includes low self-esteem, it includes anxiety, grief, anger, irritability, hypervigilance, depression. Um, we start, there's a preoccupation with anger um, and rage, and also uh, ambivalence um, and unresolved guilt. And those are just a few things, and shame as well. There's a way in which racial trauma affects our bodies and there's a term called weathering. And so weathering is when, um, because of this chronic stress that we're carrying, it starts to prematurely age us. And we start seeing these poor health outcomes. And a lot of what we're seeing with COVID 
right now and the disparities in the black community particularly is because we've been carrying this racial trauma. Glenn Scaraldi writes about trauma and he says that with trauma that we don't lose um, something, we also lose our way. That hard earned gains and dreams for the future are irrevocably lost or they seem that way. And development is seriously impaired and that grieving is about finding our way again. And so when I think about racial trauma, I think about the importance of grieving, that that is absolutely essential, that we, we engage in, um, in grieving as a part of the healing process. We have difficulty finding our way because the racial trauma is invalidated or has gone unprocessed or is ongoing. And then we're having these multiple losses. And now we're stopping long enough to start to look at all that is coming up and particularly over this past year and we're wondering we're wondering does god care we're wondering do other people care do white people care um, about our racial trauma and our grief over the past 20 months we've seen so much um, that you know we these new hashtags have emerged um, it seems like daily and so now it really is about hashtag living while black and and so we have got to figure out like how do we move forward um, in healing and so I want to just take that grief model and really look at how we do, how do we deal with um, with trauma our trauma is compounded is disenfranchised it's complicated it's anticipatory and it's generalized and compounded in that it's just pile on disenfranchised and that we are often not given the space to really grieve. And, and that certainly is the case with the shutting down of the laws around CRT and all of that. It's like we're, we're not allowed to, to grieve. It's complicated um, in many ways. There are layers of it that we're dealing with not just grief, but it's bitterness, it's anger. We're dealing with all of that. Um, there's an, an anticipatory nature around it in that, um, you know, before we even uh, are able to grieve or to deal with what it is that um, we are feeling and what we're experiencing that oftentimes uh, for many of us, we, sh we can shut ourselves down um, and we can say that, um, no, you know, you can't, you can't say that, you can't be that, you can't do that. Um, and because out of, out of fear of what might happen um, if we actually dream and if we actually hope and, and that is dashed. And lastly is generalized, is that we have this generalized grief and trauma where it's not really, you know, you can't really pin it on one thing, but it just seems to be really pervasive. Um, and a lot of it's just the state of the world. It is the state of the church. Um, it's about politics. And, and so we think about all of these ways in which we, uh, we're dealing with grief. Uh, and we look at the grief model in terms of how do we work through that and apply it to racial trauma. If you think about those stages of grief, there's shock and denial and there's depression and guilt, anger and bargaining. And then you start to see kind of an upward turn and reconstruction, meaning making and acceptance and hope. Now, this is not a linear, like step one, two, three, and we just make our way through that. Like we tend to circle in and out. Um, it's like a figure eight. And so at some points we may be feeling anger and then there's denial. Um, if we think about how with racial trauma and just given what we've experienced over generations, there certainly has been shock and denial. And some of us are still in that place um, where we are stunned by what happened uh, or we are denying what happened. If we consider the reactions uh, around the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, that it led to shock for many of us, um, but unfortunately for some it was denial. And for some it was this belief that, you know, somehow they deserved it. And that's so, so uh, evil and disturbing. Um, we go through this phase of depression and guilt. Um, and so whether it's COVID related or it's around race, our feelings of sadness and grief are almost unbearable. And there is a way in which we carry guilt feeling that somehow I should have or could have done something to have prevented it. I think about the, the uh, teenager who filmed the murder of George Floyd and she t spoke about how at night she, she can't sleep and that she apologizes and apologizes and apologizes to George Floyd because she could have done something and you think, wow, she's 16 years old and she feels like she could have done something.
And that's a kind of trauma that we carry. We deal with anger and bargaining, in which we, we it just in our justifiable anger, um, it goes and leads to rage. Um, it goes and leads to lashing out at God and others, um, in which we desperately want to change the situation. We want relief from our pain. Um, and, and we've certainly seen that over this p pandemic period and just the uh, anger and rage over injustice. The bottom line is that we all have had stories um, in, in our family line and even in our own lives. But to go deeper and to, um, to begin to heal, we need to move to the place where we begin to understand that time does not heal all wounds. It doesn't. Judith Herman talks about recovery and how recovery from trauma unfolds in several ways. And the first one is establishing safety. And the next is, is remembrance and mourning. And the third one is reconnection with ordinary life. So I, I look forward to unpacking more about Judith Herman's um, model around healing. Uh, and with that, I, I want to end and just to say that as we're healing from racial trauma, um, there's a quote from Susan Delaney, um, Dr. Susan Delaney, where she talks about how we grow around grief, that we actually become bigger, that in the end, our feelings of loss become a small part of an enlarged mental and emotional space, um, and that grief um, may actually be a doorway to something new, like becoming an activist. And so I would say the same is true about trauma and racial trauma to be specific. And with that, I, I want to end. Um, but my hope is that as we begin to address in, in our pain and to begin to heal um, and we begin to um, become activists, that all this will help guard against pessimism and hopelessness, that nothing will ever change. And that we remember our faith. We remember black love, black joy, uh, and black hope. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Sheila, that was, that was powerful. Uh, I want to do a quick follow-up question before I go into my presentation, and then we will have time after the musical interlude uh, to expand this conversation. We spent so much time last year uh, trying to make sense of all the protests. Masses of black Americans, uh, even joined by uh, many concerned white Americans, uh, protesting injustice. And I always thought that all those people in the streets, there's a lot more going on than just protesting a particular racial incident. And when you talked in your, in your uh, presentation about there is the infliction of racial harm, but then the denial of it. It sort of locks you into this vicious cycle where you're not crazy. You know when you are experiencing racism uh, and when you are experiencing racial pain and you, you want to give voice to it and, and you're just met with denial. And I just felt that some of what was pouring out in the protests um, were, were symptoms of some of the trauma that we don't always have outlets to sort of process that. And we'd we'll love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I, I think you really have hit on something there and that what we've seen is um, that, I think I'm frozen. <laughs> I hear you. you, you're good. Uh, can you hear us? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, okay. you're good. Sorry about that. I, I feel like you really have hit on something that um, if you think about, you know, I talked about how we, because of denial, um, we have really uh, not been able to look inward and to have people to gather around us, to pour out into the streets and to say, in a way, affirming the realities of, yes, this experience, the experience of Black people on the ground is real. Um, and that in many ways, that was a first time uh, for, for many of, I would say, more younger folk. But to actually see that level of outpour, outpouring uh, was something that was new. Um, there was an element of healing in that. And it was an element of hope in that. Um, I struggle with it at the same time because in some ways it felt like, I don't know why everybody was there. 
there certainly were some who really wanted to say, I see you, I hear you, change has to happen. And then there are others who it was a performance. And, and to fast forward months later, 18 months later and more, that we're seeing a drop off in terms of uh, these statistics that are looking at yeah, people's perceptions about systemic racism and the experience of black lives. And, um, and to see such a dramatic drop off is, um, it's, that's sad um, to see that. Um, and yet I try to hold on to the, the hope and um, that there were masses of people who were serious. Yeah. They were there and yeah. they were saying, I'm, I see this, I wanna do something about it, I want change. And so I, I really am looking for who are those people? Who are those people that we can align with and partner with and move forward? This is, these are dangerous times um, and we need all hands on deck. And, and, and so it's really about not just me, but I, I believe that our community, we've got to find those people um, within our communities and outside of our communities to come together and, and work to really make systemic change. Thank you so much. As I'm walking over here, I hope you're pulling up my slide. Yes, <laughs> sweet. I want you to sit there with that opening graphic because there's been appropriate um, language about holding on to uh, to hope, and, and we definitely need to do that. Uh, but I'm going to, just for the few moments I have, uh, to, to be almost like in a classroom setting with Dr. Brogdon as I get to talk with you about something that's near and dear to my heart, and, and it is the issue of, of nihilism. So Black Faith is um, a wonderful, wonderful resource. It helps us to combat meaninglessness, hopelessness, uh, disillusionment because of bad religion. I mean, it's easy to lose faith in, bad re in religion itself when you see um, religion and God and goodness so grossly misrepresented. Let me give you a couple of examples of black faith trying to um, grapple with meaninglessness and hopelessness. Now this is a quote coming out of the era of uh, African enslavement. Uh, this is from Bishop Daniel Payne who talks about uh, the experience of some enslaved Africans. Oh, we love to talk about uh, blacks who became Christians and the dancing and the shouting and the singing and the preaching, but there were also Blacks who saw their Christian slave masters um, claiming to be, you know, believers in God and, uh, and to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, not only was it reported among Frederick Douglass, but if you study slave narratives, you will find that the most abusive slave masters were always Christians. And so it produced atheism among African-Americans. This is coming out of the era of black codes, Jim Crow. This is a, a prayer from W.E.B. Du Bois. As you can see, he is grappling with some real hard issues. He says, forgive us, good Lord. We know not what we say. Bewildered we are and passion toss, mad with the madness of a mobbed, mocked and murdered people straining at the armposts of thy throne, we raise our shackled hands and charge thee, God. Here's the question, what does this all mean? I mean, surely there has to be some plan behind why we are experiencing this history. You get a little further into the Jim Crow era on the other side of the civil rights movement and those questions are still being asked. Important book mentioned last night by Dr. Kevin Cosby, William Jones, right here from the city of Louisville. Grew up in the black church, left the church, wrote a book entitled, 
is God a white racist? And in this book, he is dealing with issues of theodicy. Uh, and, and you do work in theodicy, whether it's in theology or philosophy, it is trying to wrap your head around the problem of evil. What Jones is grappling with is how do you make sense of black suffering? Uh, black suffering that is so widespread uh, and the product of people who claim to be Christians. And so if this is a Christian nation and blacks are experiencing 240 plus years of enslavement followed by another 103 years of another form of, of, of what we would call neo-slavery that then gets followed by the era of mass incarceration. It seems as if God has a problem with black people. And so he asked the question, is God a white racist? So it is in this era that I uh, the, this book is on sale in the bookstore. I hope you will go and buy two copies. <laughs> My book, Hope on the Brink, I explore the issue of nihilism. Nihilism is a descriptive term uh, to talk about the sort of collapse of meaning and the loss of hope. Uh, Nietzsche wrote about it in Europe, but while he was talking about nihilism in Europe, Africans were being enslaved in the Americas and no one was thinking about the contours of nihilism that would emerge because of centuries of racism. So what I try to explore in the book is that when you fight racism, it's a fight on two levels. It is a fight on the, the systemic, the external level, systems, uh, discriminatory laws, unjust policies, but then there's also the internal work that we must do within the black community. Here's a quote from my book that says, this racialized form of nihilism in America gives blacks the burden of trying to make sense of racism, the persistence of racism, why does it never go away? The grinding power of racism. Over time, this exacts a considerable spiritual, psychological, and social toll that leads to the eventual breakdown of a substantial number of our institutions and persons. We sing, we shall overcome. We sing, that we're like that energizer bunny. We can take a licking and keep on ticking, but that is not true. Many black people have broken under the weight of this. They have died. They have been unable to make sense of all of this. And we don't talk about it enough. Cornel West talked about this in the first chapter of his book, Race Matters, and uh, it was a major influence on why I wrote the book, as well as uh, the, one of the best books I read in seminary, uh, Beverly Tatum's book, Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria? She talks about you know, a racial identity This is an important graphic that I talk about in the book that will help you to understand why the nihilistic threat is so real. West talked about in times past, there were buffers in the black community that warded off the nihilistic threat. Now, while not ideal during the uh, years of segregation, black people had, we had our own institutions. We had our own media, we had our own press outlets, we had our own churches, we had, we had control of our entertainment entities. We had black schools with black teachers in them and black principals and black guidance counselors. We had our own businesses that we owned and, and of course our complex and sophisticated family structures. But the, but the thing about racism is that it doesn't stop. It keeps pounding against these buffers. And when you keep beating against something, and they teach you this in the military, if you are ever captured and interrogated, it is not a matter of if you break, it is a matter of when you will break. And over time, our structures and our buffers, the things that try to ward off the nihilistic threat have been cracking. And when, they have been, and when they have cracked, 
people in our community um, are breaking. And I want to end my presentation with just a little bit of we're seeing nihilism even in our churches. It was a few years ago, Dr. Eddie Gloud wrote an article entitled, The Black Church is Dead, and oh, when he published that article, the black pastors across the country were huffing and puffing, they were all upset. I don't know where he is, we're still here. Uh, Dr. Gloud did not mean black churches will disappear, but he argued that black churches are no longer those central institutions that they used to be. And some of that is because black churches moved away from the radical tradition, started adopting secularists and prosperity philosophies and not fighting to hold on to black life and to promote black hope. And so people started turning to other entities, other organizations, other institutions. And so I did a workshop just a couple of weeks ago uh, in the state of Virginia where I'm trying to help black pastors to understand that your church is no longer the center of the black community, that you have to understand you share your community with other organizations and entities. Uh, and if you can adjust to that paradigm, you can find new ways to be effective. Some of what we, even in the way we sing and worship, uh, shows sort of elements of nihilism. I refer to it as the turn to feel good religion. You see the caricature of black churches on movies. It's always a choir. They're always swaying. Everybody looks happy. And really, some aspects of that culture permeate our churches. I mean, you can't go to a lot of black churches, and it's OK to be sad. It's OK to feel upset and depressed. No, we have to be happy. Don't let me leave the same way I came. Why not? What's wrong with how I came? And so there's almost this suppression, this trying to ignore pain that I think is only fueling widespread nihilism. There's a very, very powerful story uh, in, the, uh, in the beginning of the fourth chapter as I talk about uh, nihilism as it intersects with black religion where there is a story at a conversation with a black woman who was, who was in tears crying because her church had told her that you, know, you can ask God for anything, and if you do the right things and you live right, that God will give you anything. And she has been doing this for over 20 years, and this one thing that she keeps asking God for, she cannot get it. And she asks, what is all this for if God can't do this one thing for me? I realized as she was crying in that moment that it wasn't a time for me to talk about the theology of her church but I just try to reassure her um, that there's real value to her faith uh, and that God honors that grappling with meaninglessness and hopelessness. And so to me, one of the growing edges for the black faith tradition, at least within the sort of Christian side, is we are going to have to give our people space to talk about to sit with and to grapple with their pain, with meaninglessness, with hopelessness. We have to stop shutting that down and pretending that it is not real. Because my sisters and my brothers, it is. Thank you.
Dr. Hill, Sheila, uh, thank you so much uh, for, you know, being a part of this. I want to uh, also thank the organizers for this festival for giving us space to talk about black pain, uh, black trauma, uh, and the nihilism that I think is inevitable when you have systems like this. Uh, you need space to, to grapple with that. Do Dr. Hill, what, what, is, what was your sort of overall impressions of some of the things Dr. I mean, Sheila Wise Rose presented on just a few moments ago as she was talking about uh, trauma? Because I don't think we talk enough about that in the black community. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brogdon. I think um, Dr. Sheila Weiss, uh, uh, Weiss's presentation was very compelling. What I thought was most interesting was the dis discussion about uh, both big T and little t trauma and how trauma is not just sort of uh, one dimensional, but trauma comes across and it arrives in many different ways and many different forms. And black folk on a regular basis every day are navigating these big T, small T traumas. And that they are multi-layered. Uh, they arrive from childhood up into adulthood. It doesn't go away even in the latter years of life. And that it is something that, that continues to impact uh, black families, black communities, black churches, and our encounters with, with people of different backgrounds and, yes. and uh, races and ethnicities and cultures and genders and so forth, even in the broader, broader world. Uh, we haven't had enough conversations about black trauma. I think that you're right, um, Dr. Brogdon, that we often get preoccupied with the celebration in the black church tradition. We celebrate the crescendo uh, of ecstasy and overcoming without sitting with and understanding the power of lament, the power of leaning into rage, uh, what I call prophetic rage, yeah. which is a part of trauma. Yeah. Um, that prophetic rage, righteous indignation is a, uh, an engagement with trauma. It is a, an awareness of trauma. It is a, an awakening to the realities of suffering and wrongdoing. Uh, and, and, and this is why I think her presentation was very compelling, very yeah. powerful. Yeah, I, mean, I absolutely agree because, I mean, when, you, when you're living in a kind of culture where uh, black life is not regarded and you see um, encounters with the police ending in death, my son lives in the state of South Carolina, uh, and he just very, in a very passive way, was telling his sister, he had been pulled over seven times uh, in, in, you know, in a, in a three or four month period. Uh, and, and as a father, I live with terror, knowing he is in a state where an interaction with a police officer could be the end of his life. And both of my sons live uh, in South Carolina. I, I carry that in my body. Mm. And I can't always take that to church. Because again, it's just not always space where you can grapple with that. It's celebrate how good God is. And God is good. Uh, but grappling with that is not always easy. So Sheila, that's, that's, it's just a wonderful gift. What were some of your impressions of either Dr. Hills or some of what I was able to discuss earlier? Um, I, I think that with Dr. Hill, the, the sense that we need to be able to dream in the midst of that. And I know that the holding that tension um, around lament or grieving um, the pain of it all and the celebration of it all, but that as we move forward, we have to hold those two. Yes. And, and to have this sense that there is a hope and there is a future for us and for our children. And we have to be intentional about making sure that we're transmitting that to our kids and, um, and to ourselves and that we can dream and we can hope. And so that was a, a, just a powerful reminder of that because it can feel um, very heavy and very despairing um, because there's so much that is happening in the world and in the church that's, um, that's disturbing and painful. And so to remember to hope and to dream is so important. And so I thank you for that. Um, I think Dr. Brogdon around um, when you spoke about nihilism and the buffers that were there and how we have lost a lot of those buffers and, and just the need for us to really 
examine what are those institutions that were there that helped us. Um, the church was one of those. And, and now there are other organizations as well. But I agree with you um, just in, in terms of our being able to partner with and moving forward um, and reestablishing those buffers in our communities and not waiting for someone else to do it, but are actively being a part of that. So thank you for that, Dr. Brogdon. You're very welcome. And you know, anytime I'm, um, I do a lot of consulting work and, and one group I provide consulting services for is actually one of the largest black denominations in the country, the National Baptist Convention of America. And when I'm advising uh, pastors, I encourage them that when you're thinking about your staff, you, you better have someone uh, in the mental health field uh, on your ministry staff. And I think that's, that's very, very important because yeah. I think our sisters and brothers in the mental health field are gonna be some of the most important leaders, I think, in, in the black community here in the next few decades as yeah. we continue to, to talk about uh, the impact of racism on our, our overall health. Because if you look at the data, uh, highest rates of hypertension, highest rates of depression, yeah. uh, in the 70s, African Americans were the least likely to commit suicide, that, that uh, data has flipped completely upside down. Uh, yeah. The yeah. last funeral I did was for a, a black kid, 19 years old, who took his life. Uh, and so people are killing themselves while everyone's having a party in church. Yeah. And we, we, we cannot shut down pain. We cannot shut down this trauma. We cannot shut down people who can't make sense of this all. Uh, because it makes us feel uncomfortable. We, and, and I love how you said the, 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 that we got to do both, and I do. We have to dream and also give, uh, give yeah. voice to that. And so that's just been a real gift in, in what you've shared. Uh, and thank you for the work that you're doing because it's just so critically important. Yeah, can I chime in on that point Please. very quickly? I think one of the challenges is that we, we tend to, to sort of pathologize younger black children particularly young black boys, yeah. when they're uh, much smaller. Um, but when those same boys and girls become, become uh, adults, um, their bodies are no longer viewed as sites of trauma, of hurt, of pain, mm -hmm. of sorrow. And so the criminal justice system does not have space for black trauma. Uh, in fact, you can see the dramatic uh, disparities between how white males are treated in the courtroom and how black men are treated in the courtroom. There is no regard for, or very often very little regard, for the conditions that have led to those positions or even the social, political, economic conditions that, uh, that impact unjustly uh, black boys and girls and that become uh, black men and women. And so the, ma the, the system of mass incarceration um, and also homelessness and poverty yeah. play into the problem that we have of really taking seriously black trauma in terms of, of adult life. And so I think that that is a travesty, but the church has been complicit in that, not just black churches, but white churches as well. Absolutely. Uh, we don't take, take seriously the reality of black trauma in, in, uh, in our congregations, because I think that uh, we get so caught up in the, uh, the, uh, the, the crescendo of the cross and the resurrection. Yeah. We focus on the resurrection, but we have a real problem with, with, the, with the cross, mm -hmm. yeah. the crucifixion. Yeah. And, and I think you're right, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Sheila, we have to have both, uh, because if we stay in despair, then that leads to a deeper form of nihilism uh, that can can really sort of be debilitating um, and lead to all forms of you know ch challenges around you know uh, abuse or uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, and all of the other conditions that come with 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 nihilism and with despair. And at the same time, we need to have some vision and some hope, some promise, or some vision for what can be in the midst of the trauma. Yeah. I'm I'm very concerned yeah. about staying in the trauma and trying to live with trauma while also looking to that vision of hope. I think we need, we need to have both and, and struggle and reckon with that. 
Sheila, do you want to chime in? Because I, I, I have something I want to add to that as well. Um, I, I think about when you, you talked about the, the young children and the, the ways in which um, children are experiencing these, um, what is called ACEs, the adverse, adverse childhood experiences. And there are so many ways in which our children are seen as older than they really are. They're treated in that way. There are ways in which um, there isn't an allowance to be a child and to um, experience that freedom of, of being a child. And, and so very early on, any, any, whether it's joyful exuberance of a black male child is categorized as something else other than the, the play of a child. And, uh, and it's a, it has a knock on effect. And we're seeing this with girls, um, black girls who are being referred um, to law enforcement for minor, minor offenses in the schools. And these are adverse childhood experiences that then, then has that knock-on effect in the child's life. And there's studies that show that if very early on there are positive experiences in a child's life, and whether that is um, churches that are coming alongside pastors, pastors that are coming alongside families, the community is a part of this child's life, and, and whether it is uh, the after-school program, but all of the ways in which we can pour into these children um, and in which we can reverse some of the damage that has been done very early on. And so, so it's so important that we really think intentionally about what is the role of our faith? What is the role of the black church in helping to facilitate that and creating those safe spaces where healing can actually occur? Like we have a building in many cases and whether it's a storefront or whether it's you know, some humongous building, we have space where if we actually open the doors and we align even with the communities, uh, community organizations to really serve our children and really uh, come against the nihilism so that that next generation is able to dream and is able to hope. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. It's one of the reasons why I am a uh, scholar of slave religion, uh, Dr. Hill, as you were we're, we're talking, you know, you don't want us, you don't want to, to sort of leave us with, with the despair piece. And to me, that's the genius of slave religion. Because mm. yeah. you, you're talking about people who the entirety of their lives was being an enslaved person. And so yeah. they had to find out what hope meant without freedom. They were always working toward that, except for the last generation that, of course, saw uh, slavery abolished at the end of the Civil War. But but there were generations, that's all they would ever know. They were working towards something better, but it was never realized in their life. And so I think one of our challenges today is we've got to drink a little deeper from our tradition, that we have a generation of people um, within the black community, we don't know who we are. Uh, the first time I read a book written by a black person, I was in my 30s pursuing a master's degree. And so most black people are socialized in this country not to know who they are, where they come from, um, just that, you know, we, 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 were, we were slaves and, and now we're free. And when you turn on the news, there's some, someone of us being arrested for something. I mean, right. so uh, we, we got to, I think, draw on that tradition because I think it's going to help us to wade into the moral ambiguity, there is another side to it because nihilism doesn't always lead to atheism. Sometimes it leads to a healthier understanding, a deeper understanding uh, of your faith. And, and, and that's what I'm, I'm pushing for. And I, and I wanna tell you about two resources because you know, I always gotta get you reading. Uh, and this book is actually in the bookstore. It's entitled Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Uh, so you, you got to get this book uh, along with, uh, with Sheila's text. If, if you're just interested in exploring uh, the, the, the legacy and, and the role of trauma uh, in the black community and adding, you know, some of those terms to your, uh, your, your sort of black lexicon. And then Google the sentencing project, the sentencing project, uh, and that will give you wonderful data to show you what happens in courtrooms when a black person and a white person are convicted of the same crime, what sentencing looks like. Because what you're gonna see is that there are huge disparities. A black person and a white person be convicted of the same crime, 
but the darker your skin, the heavier your, your, your sentence is going to be. And so when we're talking about reforming the system of mass incarceration, yes, we, we have to address things like policing. We're going to also have to do some work uh, in the area of sentencing as well. Doc, if, if, I, if I may add please, to, to please, that. Please, please, as we wrap up this a, segment. Yes. Absolutely, such a powerful point. I'm thinking about the, the, the debate now on uh, critical race theory and the need to educate young people on the history of enslavement and trauma and, and why there's such a tension and, and reluctance to run a really struggle with that, that history. But that's, that's something that I think you're absolutely right. We have to find a way to educate you know, um, uh, a new generation of folks on that deep history. Yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Sheila, we have a couple minutes I wanted for to a brief just add, Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to add one other point, and that was that um, I, I, the critical race theory argument is really a confusing one, because when I think about just you look at the, the Old Testament and just the admonition to, to remember, to remember. <laughs> to, to remember the whole story, not half a story, not the good parts of the story, but the whole story. And that is where we're at right now. We're at a juncture where uh, America needs to, and the church particularly, needs to look at the whole story mm. because forgiveness and really moving towards reconciliation requires looking at the whole story. And repentance means owning it, making a commitment to turn around and go in an opposite direction, stop doing what you're doing and doing something different. And so if we don't stop and look at this, and, and own the whole truth and tell the whole truth about it, we are going to still go around this rock over mm. and over again. It is going to be a never ending story. At this point, as black people, we have got to tell the whole story. Yeah. Whether anybody else tells the whole story, we've got to tell the whole story. And we've got to work through the pain of the whole story yes. and the blessings and the joy that was even in the whole story. Um, but we've got to hold both of that and, and put it front and center, whether anybody agrees with us or not, or comes alongside or wants to enact laws, we've got to be steadfast about this is the truth. This is where God was in the story, is in the story, and, and is going with us going forward in the story. Wow, 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 that, that, that's powerful. I think that's, that's calls for a clap there. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna press the reset button and now I'm give you an opportunity to um, ask the panelists a very, very brief question. And so if you could step to the mic, give us your name and your question. Hi, my name is Starlet Thomas and my question is, how do we begin to mourn this loss of authentic human being and belonging due to racialized trauma? Yeah, wow. Well, you know what? I. I'm really, uh, I, I feel like there's a, there's a power in lament. And um, Dr. Brogdon, you referenced that. Um, and I think Dr. Hill as well, but the, the, the grieving and the lamenting and how it's connected with our faith is that of being absolutely real and authentic before the Lord about what it is we're feeling. We're not sugarcoating it. Um, if you look at the Psalms, you look at the Book of Lamentations and being raw and real about it and grappling with that. Um, Sun Chan Ra wrote a great book, Prophetic Lament. Um, Dr. Um, Tanta Longe, he wrote a book and, and just dealing with that wrestling that happens in which we're in the process of wrestling that hope uh, begins to, to percolate and to arise. And so because we have been silenced for so long, we've got to bring this out into the light um, and to be open and to share and to have people come alongside us. We're not in this alone. I, I just quickly want to end. I loved the fact that hundreds and hundreds of pastors showed up um, yesterday yes. at the, uh, the, the murder trial. And that, that was just such a powerful statement. Um, and that the reality is that, you know, the defense attorney, why are all these black pastors here? They are here because they are essential. They are, uh, they are surrounding this grieving mother and they are being a presence with her. And that is so powerful. And so um, just to say, we, we need to do that for one another. 
to come alongside, to surround one another, to create those safe spaces where we can start to unpack this stuff. And there are many ministries that are doing that um, in, in the Boston area, in New York City, um, around the country. And we've got to identify where, where are those places. And I would also point to an, an old religious practice that got uh, outlawed in the contemporary black church and it's a testimony service. Uh, that was oh, yeah. a, a practice Absolutely. where blacks had an opportunity yep. to, to give voice to their experience. But yeah. as we have routinized worship uh, and we have to begin and end it at set times, that Absolutely. has gotten pushed out and there was, and it wasn't moved anywhere. It was just completely pushed out. So it became another example of people not being able to give voice to some things. So that's good. Let them testify. Yes. Uh, thank you. Is this on? It's on? Yes, okay. it is. First, I want to share with folks here my experience on the number four bus last night in Louisville. I met a young man standing waiting for the bus, a young black man, and we began talking, 22 years old. He felt compelled to explain to me why he kept a hood over his head. And as we continued talking on the bus, I gave him the program from here. The last thing he said to me, I will read this book. So I suggest that you take extra programs with you, and who knows where you'll be able to share that booklet, because they have extra ones. Take a few with you to your church. My questions are two. One, why no mention of black mosques? I just hear black churches. What's happening with black mosques? And secondly, I wonder, since we have people from the Baptist Seminary here and working with pastors, what would happen if you said, every member of the congregation, are you registered to vote, first of all? I come from a city called Pittsburgh where people will know the statistics about football players, but if you say, who is your representative in Congress, their mind goes blank for the most part. So I think that every pastor in every church or mosque or synagogue should say, are you required, are you registered to vote? Do you know who your representative is? And last week, did you make a phone call to that person? Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, is that feasible among black leadership to say, if we have a, we have a rally or we have a church service, are you registered to vote? And then what about black mosques? Well said. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, to, uh, for your first point of sharing the information with, with the young man uh, on, the, on the bus, I think that that is a wonderful and very courageous act. Sometimes the most difficult thing to do is to reach out to the person right next to you, yeah. uh, those who are closest to you. We often talk about the grandiose task of of uh, racial reconciliation and transformation. But sometimes great victories are won in the small, uh, gentle, courageous steps of opening oneself up to someone who is different, to recognize that that's a human being with thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and with ideas, and with struggles, and that has complexities that will value and appreciate perhaps those kinds of connections. Uh, so thank you so much for, for, for doing that. I think that the, the, the challenge with with the black church and the, um, the Muslim community is very profound. There's a huge divide between black churches and, uh, the, uh, and, and, and mosque. And the reason for that largely has to do with the evangelical roots of the black church and this presumption of the, you know, sort of uh, exclusivity of, of Jesus and, and Christian theology that has sort of um, uh, alienated other religious traditions uh, away from the black church. So a lot of black pastors, a lot of black churches are not as close to and involved with uh, mosque as they should be. Usually, like in the city of Raleigh, there are interfaith groups. There are uh, groups that work on interfaith relations and programs and events and protests and demonstrations where certain pastors come together to do that great work of dialogue and conversation and solidarity around social justice work. But a lot of work needs to be done. And of course, the history of, of the black church with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. being at fr uh, front and center and 
the nation of Islam is very troubled in terms of the relationship between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and how that divide took place during the 1960s and continues to create challenges for today's uh, solidarity movement. Uh, but finally, I think that there's a real opportunity, a real opportunity for social uh, and political engagement for black churches. And there are souls to the polls rallies that, took, that take place all across the country and especially in the state of, 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 of uh, North Carolina. But by and large, it's the theology that needs to be expanded, yeah. that we need to expand our imagination and theology to understand that God is, is at work in all areas of human life and that the goal and the aim uh, of our beliefs is not just soul salvation, but it also has to do with material um, and spiritual, emotional, and psychological, and political enlightenment as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for that, uh, especially around voter engagement. Uh, in North Carolina, we're really struggling with the issue of voter suppression. Um, you'd be surprised, or maybe some of us wouldn't be surprised, at the work uh, that's going on across the state of North Carolina around real intentional efforts to disenfranchise uh, voters and how uh, churches have to be involved now. There's, there's no longer um, a, an option. They have to be engaged uh, to help not only register people to vote, but to get them to the polls as well. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hill. I think we got time for one more question. I enjoy it very Highly, but I'm troubled because we talk about the children, but we got to recognize adults. You help the children all you want, they got to go home mm -hmm. to parents with trauma. I did not know I had trauma till the other night. My son is 45 years old. I didn't realize that he was 30, that he was assaulted by a family member. And the reason why he didn't tell me, because I realized, I didn't realize later on, and they call me a bazooka. And it's a person that don't mind fighting. And I'll fight till I see blood. And I won't stop. Thanks be to God, he delivered me. But I learned in the church, and I'm going to give you the question, but I had to deliver myself because I didn't find out to the other night I had trauma. I learned to live. I learned to enjoy my God. I learned to he wait on him. I learned to live in the church and in the world. But I had problems too. But I learned to tell people, you're going to make it. It's not going to be like this all the I passed her, but I had to take a cell, uh, sabbatical. I go to get my master's, but I'm not just carrying my problems. I carry everybody's problems that I have ministered to to try to get them to understand. I work with the children. I work with the senior citizens. Yes. But it do you no good if you don't deal with the adults and get them to see that they have traumas in their lives. That go back, because I am one, I have seen a connection of from children to adults. But getting them to believe, bringing my son, I'm calling to try to bring him here, and I thank you. But there was trauma on the telephone with trying to understand what was going to take place. But, to get him to understand, he was in the church, he loved the church, he loved God. But getting him to understand that there's trauma in him. Can you give us your him, question, give us your question. Okay, the, that's what I wanted to know. How are we going to work to get our adults, our 45 years old, our 50 years old, our 20 years old, our 10 years old, 14 years old, that our parents, mm -hmm. they got children, they're raising. Thank and you. They can't understand. And our girls, those that go into jail and the prisons and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. 
We're working hard to try to get them to understand. But they go home. And I want to tell you this, please, when you do your books, please think about audio, the those that can't read. Please think about movies. Please think about things that those that's not there yet. Please, because this information need to get out to them that cannot, but they want it. Yes. Please. Thank you. Yes. Sheila, do you want to respond? Yeah. yeah uh, first off, my book is in audio as well, um, <laughs> but it's not about my book. It's more about the realities that I mentioned this before, that there are ministries, organizations um, that are connected with churches around the country. Uh, First Baptist Church in New York City and Harlem has Hope, the Hope Center. They actually provide free therapy for people. Um, in Boston, Roxbury Presbyterian has the Corey Johnson program where it is really an open forum for people in the community, it's in the black community to come and share their story, their trauma. And so more and more churches need to provide those spaces yes. that people in the, con the community know they can come and that they don't have to even be a person of faith, but they can come and they can hear someone else's story. They can share their own story. They can share their own pain. They can have people be a presence with them, pray for them, uh, and even getting them hooked into ongoing counseling. So those, they exist. And it really is about, I want, you know, the churches to really intentionally seek out those kinds of programs. Many of them are wanting to replicate, wanting to train uh, others on how to do this. And so for the sister, yeah, I, it will be wonderful that your son knows like down the road, that particular church I can go to, and I can go to on a particular night and sit in the back and just let other people go forward until I'm ready to share my story. Um, and so I would just encourage churches to, to be open uh, to the community as a whole, as a place of healing and as a sanctuary. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you for that powerful question and sharing that. Yeah, that, thank you. That, that thank just you. adds so much to our conversation. Well, the last thing, uh, I want you to be able to leave with something uh, specific, something that's a sort of next step for you uh, in your uh, educational and advocacy journey. And so I'm going to ask our panelists if they could just give us a, uh, just a brief, what's the next step people can take? Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Brogdon. I think the, the most courageous step any of us can take, and the temptation is to want to sort of go out and change the world, that's great, but begin with self-reflection, self is to begin with the hard, courageous task of looking inward and thinking critically about one's own journey and how that journey uh, has impacted not only uh, those around you, but also how it's connected to the broader world. It takes courage, I think, to really, really tell the whole story. Yeah. It takes courage to look at one's family history and the systems that have continued to perhaps participate in unjust systems or somehow been impacted by those, those un unjust systems in, in maybe good or bad ways. But I think it's important to begin with an inward journey, to begin with critical self-reflection. And then the next stage is take action is to find ways to get plugged in and get active in local communities, whether it's your congregation or whether it is uh, a number of other civil or human rights organizations to advance policy changes. Uh, but there are always great groups and organizations that's doing good work in our local communities. We have to get involved. We have to prioritize that as part of our gift to not only ourselves but our, our, our gift to the, those around us as well. Thank you. Sheila. Yeah. 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 Um, apart from what I've already shared, I absolutely agree with Dr. Hill around we've got to start with our, ourselves, our own pain, um, and getting help to really process that. Mm. Um, I want to lean really heavily on, and apart from the church being that sanctuary, that safe space, I, I want to have a call out to um, the white brothers and sisters and those who are um, brown as well, that we need partners, and more than partners, partners, we need brothers and sisters who are going to validate our experiences, whether it's in the workplace, whether it is in our neighborhoods, um, whether it's on the national stage, mm. 
to validate the experiences of Black folk on the ground, to come alongside us as we are journeying towards justice and freedom and reconciliation, we need all hands on deck. And this is, so if you think about 2020 and if you simply were engaging in performativity to make a solid decision that you are all in or you're not all in. We don't need people who are halfway in. We need to transform our communities, to see the, the power of God transform our communities. We need everybody in this. Um, and, and particularly, I want to I speak to the Black church and the Black community as well, is that we've got to make this front and center and keep it front and center. Uh, we can't rely on someone else doing this for us to tell our story or to even set the stage or the agenda. Like we need to go forward in that and bring others who want to come along and want to support and want mm -hmm. healing and reparations and reconciliation to join us in that, mm -hmm. in this, this journey and in this, this fight um, for justice and, and healing. Thank you, Sheila. And, and my next step is to encourage you to go to institute.bsk and there is a resource that you will find resource I wrote entitled Planning After Protesting, A Way Forward. Uh, and uh, it's a nice flip book that can be transferred to uh, a PDF. My critique so many times when we have conferences addressing black issues is we have an unfocused black agenda. And it's why we can never get anything done. Uh, it's just always, we should do this, we should do that, we should do this, we should do that. Um, and it's, we really need to find ways to organize black leadership and black organizations around some key outcomes that we can focus on for the next 25 years. Uh, so this is the assessment dean's hat I am wearing, uh, that we have to identify certain things that we, that we can galvanize ourselves around and say, well, we need to do this, 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 and this, but we can't do everything. We can't fix a 400 year problem in our lifetime, let's focus on maybe educational, economic, and reform of our criminal justice system. If we can find a way to organize a, a black agenda and get enough of our national stakeholders all on the same page, that then we do not only street advocacy, but the kind of policy work that we need to change laws uh, and then to have folks like you who are sitting in the room who are our community leaders to partner with us to put pressure on the people we voted into office to represent us uh, and our various organizations to learn how to leverage our power around certain focused things. And so uh, instead of the black community, we need our Moseses, but we also need Nehemiahs. We need folks who are about infrastructure uh, and who can build and help us to take those next steps. And so I, I wanted to make that resource available to you. Thank you so much, my sisters and brothers, for your time.